Save big on your Memorial Day barbecue, all in the Fries app. Get tender USDA choice bone and ribeye steaks for five seventy seven a pound with a digital coupon. Limit five. Then buy two get three free on twelve packs of delicious Coca Cola, Pepsi, Dr Pepper, or Seven Up, all with your card. Shop these deals at your local Fries, less than five miles away, or click the screen now to download the Fries app to save big today. Fries, fresh for everyone. Prices and product availability subject to change. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Whoa, Memorial Day. That means summer is here. And if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to Body to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. Period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's nix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's knix.com. You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So this week we have the one only take no substitutes, Kevin D. Randall. Joining us, he's the author of millions of books, not just UFOs, with a specialty on Roswell, but sci-fi, his other occupation there, writing fiction books. But I would say he's in good company because before he became a famous UFO or flying saucer writer, Major Donald Kehoe wrote fiction. Some say his fact books might have been partly fiction, but I won't go there. Did you ever meet Major Kehoe, Kevin? I met him one time. He was giving a lecture to a group at Rockwell International, and uh, I was invited to the program. And after the program was over, I had a chance to chat with him for five or ten minutes. I didn't get anything exciting about it. We just talked a little bit about how things were going in the world of UFOs based on what his lecture was. But yes, I met him one time. Well, I beat you there. I met him one, two, three times. But You win. You see, I always do. I like to just boast about meetings. The problem is I met him and I was accompanied by a group of people you might know, like Alan Greenfield and Rick Helberg and a friend of mine from Brooklyn named Marty. And the issue is here is we had a pleasant visit with Major Kehoe at his home in Luray, Virginia. The very next day, we went to the headquarters of his organization, NICAP, which was, as listeners know, located near DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., probably very close to the area where they shot down Clat 2 in the movie Day the Earth Stood Still. Bet you didn't know that. And Richard Hall pointed his shaking finger at me and said, you're not welcome here. That doesn't really sound like Richard Hall. 
Maybe he was just very pressured because he had to run the office, and Kehoe was not the sort of person, as you probably know, who would come to the office every day and put a full workday in. I found Dick Hall to be very, very congenial. He did have harsh words for me, but only because I had responded to a nasty bunch of nasty things that Stan Friedman had said about me, most of which were, were, were not true. He, he was annoyed at, uh, I guess, our byplay, and that was the only, only conflict that uh, we ever had. What's interesting about that is 10 years later, 1975, at a UFO conference in Fort Smith, Arkansas, ran into Hall, and we shook hands, buried the hatchet, and that was fine. My only regret here is that he died before we had a chance to get him on the Paracast. I have to say the same thing with John Keel. I think it would have been a really cool show if we had him on, but once again, we lost that. And part of the reason is that my former co-host, no longer with us, David Biedney, called Keel at the number that Tim Beckley gave him, and Keel said, in essence, why the you-know-what-are-you-calling-me-and-hung-up? <laughs> Uh, I had some uh, correspondence with Keel dealing with the great uh, Japanese balloon bomb explanation for the Roswell case. If you remember back in 1990, I think it was, he explained the Roswell case as uh, the remains of a balloon bomb. And I'm thinking, where did the balloon bomb hide for two years? I mean, the, the area where Brazel found the debris was a field, a pasture that he was in, if not daily, every other day. So there would have been no way for it to be a balloon bomb because, of course, in 1947, the war had been over for two years. And uh, I think the Japanese gave up on the balloon bombs early in 1945 because they didn't think they were working. And it turned out they were actually working and were reaching the uh, North American continent. They didn't do much in the way of damage, set some fires. And I think they, well, I know they killed six people in Oregon. But the Japanese were monitoring our newspapers or news sources, and the FBI and the government managed to suppress that information so well that the Japanese never got an inkling that the balloon bombs were uh, successful, so they stopped doing it. I mean, it's one time that the government oppression of the news media was probably accurate because it stopped the balloon bombing. And uh, But the day after the war ended, I, there was a, a woman in Iowa, and they'd found one of the balloon bombs early on, and she was going to write a story about it. The FBI showed up and asked her not to print the story as a matter of national security. And she waited until the war ended. And the day after the war was over, she printed her story about finding one of the balloon bombs. So, so why but, would Keel get the impression that was the cause? And I should point out the reason there was a two-year wait is the balloons fell asleep. I did not know that. I don't know what inspired him to, to come up with that. I do know, I do remember thinking, somebody said, well, John Keel's got an explanation, and I immediately went to balloon bombs, and I do not know why I did that, but then I went to the University of Iowa a library and looked up information on it and discovered everything you'd want to know about it, including a number of articles in major newspapers and magazines of the time, right after the end of the war, talking about the Japanese balloon bomb. So it, Keel had said it had been a secret because it um, affected our national uh, security in some fashion, and uh, that was why they, they hid the whole thing. And it turned out it wasn't that big of a secret. And after the six people were killed in Oregon, then they began what they called a whispering campaign, which would alert people that, you know, if you find one of these things, don't tug on it, don't play with it. It's explosive, uh, which was quite successful. The Japanese never got an inkling of that either. So I don't know what possessed him to come up with the balloon bombs, but I had already assembled all the information necessary to kind of counteract that explanation. Uh, not to mention the fact the award had been over for two years. And if the balloon, one of the balloon bombs had actually remained in the atmosphere for two years, the people doing the mogul experiments in, in New Mexico at the time probably should have gotten a hold of the Japanese who did it because they kept it in the atmosphere for two years, apparently. But it just didn't work, and I think he finally gave up. But the one thing he did do in that uh, article, we did an article in Fate magazine. We did, and I say we, uh, Keel did one, and I, Don Schmidt and I did one. And I think there may have been another person who did one as well. But the one thing he said in that that, that kind of came true, he said, 
by the year 2000, I suppose there'll be no, dozens of additional people clamoring for their 15 minutes of fame for having been in Roswell. And that prediction came true. An awful lot of people came forward with their Roswell stories, and an awful lot of them were making them up. Of course, that raises the bigger question, and we'll do a brief Roswell here. With all the people wanting to be part of the action, how do you separate all the claims? I mean, I assume if somebody has read the literature, they could come up with a story that would pass muster. Well, your pal Richard Hall kind of explained that. He said one of the first things you do is have to prove that they were actually in a place to see anything. And we had... Uh, in 1947, Walter Hott, who was the public affairs officer, had created a yearbook, and he began the um, photographic foray into this thing, I think in May or June, and finished it up by August, and they sent it off to the publisher, uh, and they got him back in November. So we had the list of 1,500, 1,600 people who were in Roswell in 1947, knowing from what Walter Hott had said that 10 to 15 percent of the people who were assigned to the base at the time were not in the yearbook. Um, we got a copy of the Roswell Army Airfield's telephone directory, and I think it's dated August of 1947. And some of the names in there were not in the yearbook. You know, people on TDY or on leave or something missed their opportunity to be in the yearbook. We also got um, copies of the city directory at the time, so we could look people up there. Um, we could ask them for, you know, if they said, well, we were, I was at Roswell in 1947, can you prove it? Um, uh, I think it was Brown, um, Sergeant Brown, Melvin Brown, Melvin Brown, who talked about this, and he does actually appear in the yearbook, but he'd given Timothy Good, and, and we got copies of it as well, orders uh, from the, the 509th Bomb Group with Melvin Brown's name on it. He was a, a NCO, a sergeant. And on one of those orders, um, Jesse Marcel's name also appears. Kevin D. Randall joining us, a class act, with Gene, Kevin, Tim, you're in. The Paracast. <laughs> Want to win a new car? Harris Auction Casino is celebrating its 30th anniversary by giving away a new car every month during our Win Your Wheels giveaway. For a chance to win, play your favorite slots using your Caesars Rewards card the last Saturday of each month. The more you play, the more entries you'll receive. Harris Auction Casino. Play for all. Must be 21 or older to gamble. No one to stop before you start. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 or 1-800-NEXT-STEP. Visit HarrisAuction.com for details. Whoa, Memorial Day! That means summer is here, and if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. You see how I could compliment you there. So I assume having all those directories, and that's one of the areas where I think the past is more accurate. Now you want to check somebody online and you've got like whitepages.com and you got to pay for it and there's no guarantee of anything. I kind of wish for the white pages and the yellow pages of years gone by. But I assume you might have found other people that you wanted to contact or learn about as a result of these directories, Kevin? 
Well, but you had to limit the search because back in the days when we were doing this, we didn't have free telephones. And my telephone bill was running two or $300 a month searching these people out. And uh, Don's was equally high. And I think Stan often said his phone bill was $800 a month. And so we had to find people who had some information. We called people who were assigned to the base at the time and knew something had gone on, but they were not part of the retrieval operation. So we had to we had to uh, go through an awful lot of that. We called people. We were looking for a guy named Robert Slusher, who we knew was there because we had uh, his name in the yearbook. As a flight crew, I think he was on Pappy Henderson's flight crew, and we were looking for him. And Don gave me a number and said, here's here's his telephone number. And I called the guy, and it turned out he'd been a major in the Army Air Forces during World War II, but he wasn't the right guy. Not long after that, I was talking to Glenn Dennis, and I mentioned the, the, this problem with people with the same names. And he and I said, we've been looking for Robert Slusher, and I got the wrong guy. And, and Dennis said to me, oh, I know Bob Slusher lives over in Las Cruces, and that was the right guy. So we got some of it that way. We also, I also had the, uh, the unit history for um, June, July, and August and into September of 1947. And names appeared in there, people on orders, people who'd done something, and, and some of the people didn't show up in the yearbook or the telephone directory. So we, we had a lot of places to go to look for names to confirm their involvement there. And then we would listen to the stories they were telling. And if the story didn't make any sense, based on what we knew specifically about the Roswell case, we began to question that. And uh, we, we learned that just people were making the stuff up simply because they wanted to be part of the story. My uh, uncle had been in Roswell, but it was in 1949. And of course, by then, of course, <laughs> the rumors were all gone and there was no talk about what had happened there. But we had to vet the people as best we could. And sometimes we made mistakes and later we're able to clarify those. So it's a long involved process that you, you just have to take what people tell you and run with it and see where you could do. We could go to the uh, the National Archives in St. Louis where the military records are housed and we would request information about a specific person if we had the right dates on it or we had a serial number or something like that, then we could verify it that way as well. So there's a lot of avenues to vet the people to determine whether or not they were actually in Roswell in the right time frame. So how would we do that in 2024? I mean, military, you can check information about that. But there is no printed phone directory. The online phone directories are commercial ventures that are not certified. You'd have to go to their X accounts, their Facebook accounts, check them in Google. How would you find out? Well, for Roswell, we, we don't have to go to those, li those, those links because I think everybody who is there in the right time frame is now dead. Um, I talked to one guy. And no, excuse me. I'm thinking of a modern case. Say Roswell happened in 2024. How would we you, find all the people? You go through the, sort of the same process, you know, uh, you, you try to de determine where you might learn something about that. This just came up, as a matter of fact, two days ago. I was looking for a case. Robert Powell, in his new book, had a case of a car being stalled, and it said March 29th, 1952. But the names were all redacted from the, from the case file. And I'm thinking, nah, they always miss something. But I went to the um, the index for the Project Blue Book files, which had the names. I had a I have a copy without the name being redacted and found out it was a guy named Tyler and a guy named Donald Stewart. OK, so I got the two names. Now, what do I do? Going through the uh, Blue Book file, there was an awful lot of the names redacted and I could figure out where Tyler and Stewart fit into the story because sometimes they actually missed the name. Sometimes there are other hints like that. Newspaper clipping. I needed a newspaper clipping on this and we discovered the problem with the Air Force file is the case didn't happen on March 29th. It happened on March 15th. And the newspaper clippings dated March 16th. So newspaper files help if you've got if you've got a date, but we were able to locate that and that gave us more information about Tyler and Stewart, but it also gave us two other names. And so when you go through the Air Force file on this case, there's all these witnesses that they talk to, but they're talking about uh, having something happened on April 16th. And they said, no, no, the date was March 29th. Well, all of that is wrong. We can just throw it away. But the point is, 
I was able to get this through the Air Force Index because I've got copies of it without the redactions in it. I was able to go through the file and find the people's names as well to verify some of that information. And then we go to newspaper clippings and we look at that sort of information. That's a wonderful resource now that we can access through the internet or um, and that sort of thing. Sometimes I have to ask people who are in the area where the sighting may have happened, if I have the date, can you check the newspapers? And that gives us information that we can run with there. And then we can look for the, the people through other sources that are available on the internet. You know, you can find, if you, if with, with luck, you can find practically anybody on the internet without having to subscribe to a whole bunch of different uh, search engines or paywalled uh, materials like that. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of luck. Let me throw something out at you out of left field, and maybe something you haven't heard of, but I got a email about this and thought, well, you've chased so many different sources, you might have heard of it. A 1991 UFO case at Contel, Atlanta, Georgia. And what the correspondent writes, it involved 150 plus employees at Contel, which is Continental Telephone Companies, during working daylight hours, crafts, missing time, burnt circles, etc. Ever hear of such a case? Not, not that one, no, I have not. Okay, we'll have to look into it then. But it, I mean, it sounds fascinating with the introduction, but of course you never know. Sometimes well, the, things- here's the flip side of that. I heard about a guy, an Air Force officer, who had flown President Kennedy on Air Force One to look at the bodies. And I think we spent six or eight months looking for this guy. Finally found him. He was living in some small, new uh, like Las Cruces or somewhere like that in New Mexico. Finally caught up with him. And the story became, he said, I said, now you were an Air Force pilot. And he said, yes. And I said, you flew President Kennedy around. And he said, well, I was an alternate pilot on Air Force One, yes. And I said, you flew him to see the bodies. And he said, no. He said, what? But he had a UFO story. He had seen a UFO off the wing of his fighter many years earlier. And through the the dome part of it, he could see the outline of the occupant, the, the, the pilot of the, the UFO. So we sort of had a body. We had President Kenny. He did fly Air Force One. Um, I don't know how we got to the point where uh, we, we were told that he had done all these things at once, but we were able to, to finalize the case and realize, yeah, it's kind of an interesting case with the UFO occupant uh, pacing the aircraft. And he did fly Kennedy around, but it wasn't that he flew Kennedy to see the Roswell bodies. Well, at least you found something. That's interesting. Let's cover, before we get into some modern stuff, a recent unfortunate development that we want to talk about here in our next segment, Dr. Bruce McAbee. Dr. McAbee was on the Paracast five times. I know you knew him. What can you tell our listeners about him? Um, Bruce was a physicist. He worked for the Navy, a PhD. He was a careful researcher. He um, provided an awful lot of scientific information about UFO sightings. I think he was well respected in the field by almost everybody who knew him. He was a he was a kind man who uh, loved the UFO phenomena and did his best to serve it through scientific methodology. Dr. Bruce McAbee died very recently. We'll go into more of that in our next segment with Kevin Randall, Gene Steinberg, Tim Swartz. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Whoa, Memorial Day! That means summer is here, and if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. 
Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. Period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's nix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's knix.com. Hi, this is James Fox, director of The Phenomenon and Moment of Contact. You're listening to The Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Now, maybe you know more about this than I do. You probably do, Kevin. Dr. Maccabee was very favorably impressed by the Gulf Breeze, Florida UFO case. Very highly disputed. What's your observation about that? I was going to kind of avoid that. We kind of have to be fair. But the thing is, we all all make mistakes. We all get caught up in our investigations. And I can point to areas of the Roswell case where Don and I made mistakes as well. We were able to correct them. Bruce was caught up in the the Gulf Breeze case, and he, uh, he declared the photographs to be authentic. You find nothing on them to su- suggest they had been hoaxed, which doesn't mean they weren't hoaxed. It just, there was no evidence presented there. I think that the case kind of collapsed because the main witness uh, had a habit of faking Polaroid photographs, which were difficult to fake, but he had found a way to do that. He used to scare the teenagers in the area when, it, when his uh, son or daughter had, had parties and he would fake ghost pictures to kind of frighten him and things like that. So he had the, the uh, ability to do that. A model that looked like one of the Gulf Breeze UFOs was found in his house, hidden under the um, the stuff in the ceiling, whatever the hell it is. I yeah. thought I heard it was the attic. Well, yeah, up in well up in the attic. It was under the installation up in in the attic. Uh-huh. So struggling to come up with the the terminology for some reason. And it was after he had moved out of the house and the new owners had, had found that up there. And so it, it, it seemed to kind of put the kibosh on that. And I think there were other problems with the case that arose. Some of the independent witnesses weren't really seeing the same craft that um, he had photographed. It was unidentified lights in the sky, which could be practically anything. So I think the case kind of collapsed under that. But, but Dr. Maccabee was was excited about the case. It was a photographic case. He applied his knowledge to it. I think that the fair thing to say is he could find no evidence on the photographs that it was a hoax. It was really the other things that came out later that, that suggested it to be a hoax. So you, you can't really blame him for the failure. He did his job by examining the photographs. And had there been something on the photographs that, that screamed hoax, he would have pointed it out. But um, it's just the way the circumstances broke. And I know Don Schmidt and I got fooled by Frank Kaufman, who claimed to be an important person in the Roswell case. And, and you'd ask, how do we vet this guy? Well, Kaufman's picture appeared in the uh, Roswell yearbook that, that Walter Hott put together. Uh, he was in civilian closing and he was receiving a medal from, I think it was Payne Jennings, one of the senior officers at the base. 
I believe the medal is a World War II victory medal. It's a black and white photo and it's kind of at an angle and I'm not sure I, I can make it out properly. But the point is he's receiving a medal, he's in the yearbook. So that kind of boosted his credibility. And, and Walter Hott told us that uh, if uh, Frank Kaufman told you something, you can believe it. And so we had that sort of thing. And it wasn't until 10 or 11 years later that his story broke down after Kaufman had passed away. Uh, Mark Rodiker, Mark Chesney, and Don Schmidt were in Roswell, and they were visiting with Juanita Kaufman, Frank's wife, and she asked him to go through his papers to see if there was anything, contracts or contractual obligations or anything that needed to be taken care of that dealt with the Roswell case. And they found a stash of old World War II typing paper. They found a couple of old typewriters. They found uh, other documentation that suggests he was making stuff up. We got a hold of his original. He'd given us a copy of his uh, discharge papers, and we got a hold of the originals, and they didn't match. So he had clearly faked those sorts of things. But we believed him up until the point that we found the evidence that uh, he was less than credible. And we were the first ones to publish that information. We made, made it clear he had made the stuff up. Now, to the credit of Don uh, Schmidt, uh, Mark Chesney, and Mark Rodiger, they withheld the information for about a year, but they'd done it because they didn't want to embarrass his wife. She was a very nice lady, and, and they didn't want to embarrass his wife. And then when she passed away, um, they were ready to go on the record. I went, I went on the record a little bit earlier than that because I thought it was information that needed to be published regardless of the implications. I know that the Kaufman children or grandchildren were angry with uh, Mark Rodiker and me because we put an article, a couple of articles in the International UFO Reporter exposing Kaufman. And so they were mad about that and I can understand that, but uh, it, it was what the truth was. So, you know, you, you, you take all of that and, and look at it as a way of trying to figure out who's who and what's going on. But it all applies to today's environment as well. There are avenues that can be searched. In some cases, it's a little harder. Getting information from the National Archives in St. Louis is a much more difficult task than it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago because of the privacy laws that are in effect and the um, stealing of identities and all of that. They, they become much more reticent to provide the documentation. You used to be able to get an awful lot of information about people, and then it boiled down to where you could get uh, information that was part of the public record, and then you uh, it, it, they began to boil it down to a single page. So it became almost impossible to use it, but it would tell you where the guy was, what schools he'd been to, what ranks he obtained, what what awards and decorations he had, things like that, part of the public record. And that, that sometimes helps us vet a, a witness. You, but you can still do that today, but it's much more difficult to get the information from, from St. Louis. It always amazes me why someone would hoax something like that so so many years after the fact i mean it's i wouldn't think that it would be for monetary gain i mean no when it comes to ufos for the most part nobody's gonna you know make any money off of saying that they were witness to the after effects of the roswell crash i mean you know why do you think that people like that come forward and 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 make up these stories well first of all there's there's the appeal of the spotlight mm -hmm. um, they get a, their 50 minutes of fame there are uh, depending on what you're talking about and where where, uh, where you might go there's trips to the locations um, people are calling you to get the information so there is some some sort of a monetary gain that way um, and it's just and it's just because they want to be a part of something bigger. Uh, I like to say during at the turn of the last century, not 2000, but 1900, there were all these carnivals going around. And in the carnivals, I think there were 15 guys in various carnivals saying they were the real Jesse James. Well, you know, 14 of them had to be lying. But but the other thing is, we know that uh, the 15th was lying, too. But it's just it's just a draw of the of the spotlight, the ability to um, 
to get credit for something you didn't do or uh, putting yourself in a place. And that goes on today. And there's all kinds of people that do that. Uh, take a look at the Internet. There's people commenting on stuff they have no knowledge of, but they they just need to get their opinions out there for somebody to listen to to them. Uh, and it's, it's ridiculous. The guy named Burkett, who did a book called Stolen Valor, which the Stolen Valor Act it came from, and he talked about all these guys who were, and, and women, who were claiming to be Vietnam veterans. Um, many of them were not. They just wanted that, I guess, the cachet of being a Vietnam veteran when it became a good thing. I mean, when I got back from Vietnam, it wasn't a good thing, and you didn't really tell a lot of people you'd been in Vietnam. But then um, uh, 20 years ago, it became the thing to do and talk about being being a Vietnam veteran. There was a survey, not a survey, a census taken in 1995, according to Burkett in his book. Um, and one of the questions on it was, are you a Vietnam veteran? 13 million, million people said yes. Hmm. There are, there were 2,500,000 Vietnam veterans. That's all there were. And uh, I, the last figure I heard, there's only 800,000 of us left alive. But here's people who they gain absolutely nothing by marking, yes, I was a Vietnam veteran on this census, but they did it anyway. So I don't understand the rationale of that. We'll um, understand so much more with Kevin, Gene, Tim. You're in. The Pericast. <laughs> At LASIK Plus, we know LASIK is a big decision, and every one of our patients is unique. That's why we customize your LASIK journey to you. I'm so busy right now. We offer a mix of convenient days and times, including 30-minute virtual appointments to fit your schedule. I would love it, but I have astigmatism. We treat thousands of patients with astigmatism every month with great outcomes. LASIK Plus is making your journey towards 2020 vision all about you. So visit MyLASIKOffer.com today to start your LASIK journey. Whoa, Memorial Day. That means summer is here. And if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So it's not unusual to claim you have credits that you don't really. And of course, we have a certain UFO author who pulled that stunt, Phil Imbrogno, if you recall. Yes. Supposedly, he went to MIT, had other work things, and we found out that the T-shirt he wore for MIT, it's like what you buy in any store, and that a lot of the stuff he said was completely fake. But then we have the book that he wrote with Dr. Heineck, and you wonder, was that accurate? Was it just the credentials? Where did he lie? But we understand the point. I, I look at people who claim military backgrounds who don't have them. Robert Willingham springs to mind. He was the one that came up with the Del Rio UFO crash. And for literally decades, people believed his story because he was a high-ranking Air Force officer, said he was a colonel, signed an affidavit attesting to the validity of what he said. And when I was doing the book, Crash When UFOs Fall from the Sky, back in 2010, this kind of answers one of the other questions, too, the earlier questions. I went online to see what was new about the Del Rio crash and got the information about Willingham and discovered nobody had ever vetted this guy. So I started doing that. And one of the things they said, well, we have pictures of him in his Air Force uniform in the, in the 1960s. How do you explain that? 
And I said, send me the pictures. And I looked at him and yeah, he was in Air Force uniform, but he wasn't in the Air Force. He was in what was called the Civil Air Patrol. That's an auxiliary of the Air Force, a civilian auxiliary, and they do great things. They have a cadet program where they teach people about flying and, and the Air Force and rocketry and all of that sort of thing. And then they have senior members that do search and rescue, which is an important part, saves the taxpayers a lot of money having the Civil Air Patrol doing search and rescue in, in the continental United States. But on the uniform, you could see the CIP insignia and nobody had ever picked up on that. And then there were other things on his uniform that gave it away. I got his record from St. Louis and discovered that he had been, he had joined the army in December of uh, 1945 and he was discharged in January of 1947. So he'd been in the army for about 13 months. He claimed to be a veteran of World War II. Technically he was. The war didn't officially end until 1946. So anybody who had served after the shooting stopped still got credit for being a World War II veteran. All I could find was he'd been in the service for 14 months. He wasn't a fighter pilot. He claimed that he'd been badly injured in Korea. That was why he could no longer fly fighters, but he could go in the Air Force Reserve and fly fighters. I know a bunch of Air Force fighter pilots, and I said, that true? And he said, no, the problem was the injuries that prevented you from flying fighters on active duty would have prevented you from flying fighters in the Air Force Reserve. It was all about the ejection seats, I guess, uh, was the problem. So he, he could have flown transports that didn't have ejection seats, but he couldn't have flown fighters. Could find no record of him being an Air Force colonel. The story collapsed at that point. Then you go back and you see what Len Stringfield had printed about the guy. He did those monographs um, starting in 1978-79, uh, the crash retrieval syndrome. And what he was doing was collecting the stories, publishing them, and then hoping that Others would have the capability to, to, to vet some of the stories, to find out whether they're true or not, because he couldn't possibly vet all the stories he'd gotten. So the first story that was printed by Willingham was 1948. He'd been uh, flying an F-94 fighter, and the new line alert, alerted them to this flying saucer. Well, the F-94 wasn't operational in 1948 when he claimed this happened. It did not become up uh, the... Um, New line was not operational, hadn't even been thought of at the time. So that wasn't true. Uh, later on, the story changed to 1950 because of the alert that happened in December of 1950. So they tried to plug it into that. Willingham himself said, no, that's not the right date. When I talked to him, he was talking about 1954, 1955. But uh, I could find no record of him being in the Air Force. There was, There is what is the Air Reserve Personnel Center, I think, in Denver. It is in Denver. And I wrote to them, and they could find no record of him serving or being anything. And the documentation he had presented, they said, doesn't look like ours, isn't filled out properly. So, you know, you end up vetting it. But he went to an awful lot of trouble creating this persona of being an Air Force colonel and being involved in not only one crash retrieval, but seven of them eventually. Uh, he talked about driving down the road in Pennsylvania one day. And a farmer stopped him and took him to see a crashed UFO. Now, I've driven down an awful lot of country roads and an awful lot of places. No farmer or rancher has ever stopped me to take me to show, show me a crashed UFO. But there was all kinds of things. So the Willingham story collapsed at that point. But he was a guy that went to a great deal of effort to plug himself into the crash retrieval syndrome. When you brought up Leonard Stringfield, I recall a long conversation I had with him many moons ago. And he collected a lot of the crash retrieval stories. But other than Roswell, we can go into that for a second or two. Were there any other crash retrieval stories that seemed to be genuine? I think, well, I, I was sort of the original investigator of the April 1962 Las Vegas crash, which I thought was authentic until I learned uh, some other things about it and, and figured it's probably not true, not a crash. He did things with Kecksburg, I know. Um, I think he mentioned Shag Harbor. There's very few, I think, legitimate crashes. And a lot of the tales that he had in his monographs were single witness. And you go through some other documentation, there's single witness. Ryan Wood just published an update of his um, Top Secret Magic book, which is a compendium of UFO crashes. And I asked him just the other day how many are in there. And I think he said... He said a hundred and some, I don't remember. I My crash when UFOs fall from the sky has 118, I think, in it. And and there are five or six 
that I thought might be legitimate. Everything else is kind of single, single witness. Uh, some of it's explained by natural phenomena that people misinterpreted and things like that. There's very few, I think, that are legit. But what Len was doing was collecting the stories and putting them out there, hoping that some of us like me and Don Schmidt and others would take an interest in a specific case and chase it down. And he would he would report on the um, the updated findings when he got them. He reported, I think, on the, the Willingham case. I think he reported on it two or three times. One other thing I should say about Willingham, I looked for the original story because it was supposedly in a newspaper in uh, Pennsylvania. I couldn't find that, but an early issue of Skylook, which was MUFON's original publication, there was a paragraph about Willingham and the story he told in that it was March of 1968, for those of you who have the uh, Skylooks that go back that far. And if you belong to MUFON, I think you can get access to them. Uh, you can re read the story, but it doesn't match anything that he was saying later on. So he changed the story significantly. I finished. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so what about, since you mentioned them, Kecksburg and Shag Harbor? What do we Shag call those Harbor cases? I think Shag Harbor is very, very good. That's in Canada, of course, for those of you who are not familiar with Shag Harbor. Don Ledger and uh, Chris Stiles have done a Herculean job of collecting documents, official Canadian documents about the crash and stories, witness uh, testimony and that sort of thing. Wonderful, wonderful job. Stan Gordon has done a, a Herculean job on Kecksburg. Unfortunately, I lean toward the natural phenomena for Kecksburg. Um, and I always hesitate to say that because I know of all the work that Stan Gordon has put into that investigation. And he's got some very interesting information. I think it's probably a bolide that, that came down at that time. But you have to look at all the data and decide for yourself where you want to go in that direction. There's, there's other things that suggest it was much more exciting than just a bolide. Um, there's evidence of military involvement in there. There's evidence of some kind of a retrieval operation that may have gone on. And there's a, a news reporter whose name escapes me, who did a, uh, something for the, one of the local radio stations about a week later where he put out some of the really interesting information from witnesses of this thing. Uh, but, but with Kecksburg, um, and I, hate, I always hate to say that, but I, I think that we've got a pretty good explanation for it. And I'm going to try to get a hold of Stan Gordon here in the next few days and chat him up about that again and see where he stands. Well, I know where he stands, he believes. He believes it was, an, uh, like uh, what I don't like to say, is an off-world craft. So Kevin Randall will also stick with us for the After the Paracast bonus podcast for subscribers to the Paracast Plus. There we'll focus on the Pentagon's UAP investigations, so to speak. Yeah. We have to go off something right now, and we'll get back on. With Kevin, Gene, Tim, you're in. The Pericast. Whoa, Memorial Day. That means summer is here. And if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to Body body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. Period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. 
You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's nix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's knix.com. This is Jennifer Stein, executive producer of The Disclosure Dialogues. You're listening to The Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Discussing cases that may or may not be real. And therein lies the tale. What about Virginia, Brazil? I know, of course, that James Fox did a documentary on that a year or two back. And we had him on the show. What's your take? I haven't really researched that much to to make a good a pronouncement on it. I'm I'm not really sure what went on down there, or how reliable the witnesses are. They may be extremely reliable. They may not be. I just really don't know much about that case. So I, I really don't have a firm opinion on whether it was a good case or a bad case. So let's go back to Roswell briefly before we cover many other topics. All right. If they captured a crashed flying saucer in 1947. Where is it now, and what would we have been doing with it all these years? We can trace the wreckage to a number of different places. A lot of it went to Wright Field, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where they had the uh, facilities to do the reverse engineering at the time. According to General Exxon, One of the bodies went to Denver, and the Army had a mortuary service in Denver at the time. And the idea was to learn as much as as they could about preserving that body. Because you don't get a biological sample from another world all that often. There was discussion that some of the, one of the bodies may have gone to uh, Homestead Air Force Base, I believe, which had a large medical facility. We have information that suggests parts of the craft were piecemealed out to various industries to see if they could reverse engineer them. And of course, we had the the military end of it where they would have been attempting to reverse engineering it. We could say it was at Area 51. I'm just not sure anything really went there. And if it did, it was moved after Bob Lazar started talking. It may have remained at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It may have been somewhere else. I had heard one rumor, which I thought was fascinating, that the Navy has some kind of a search facility on an island in the Pacific Ocean. The Navy owns the island, and so you can't get to it. That would be the perfect place to put some of this stuff because you wouldn't have trouble with the civilians getting out there to take a look around. So we've, we've traced it to certain locations, and we've been able to go no farther. So if you wanted an idea of where it ended up, I would say Barry Goldwater talked about a blue room at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and asked permission from General LeMay, Barry Goldwater being a major general in the uh, Air Force Reserve, and asked Curtis LeMay if he could see that room. And LeMay said, not only no, but hell no. And if he asked me again, I'll quote march you. And we have letters from Goldwater verifying that tale. So we could say, well, maybe some of it is, in fact, still at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So it's, it's just kind of once we get it out of Roswell, out of Fort Worth, we can get it to Wright Patterson. We've got a couple of places where it might have gone, but that's as far as we can trace it. You know, it is funny to me that you have these stories, like from uh, uh, Senator Goldwater, about the uh, Pentagon's obvious knowledge or some kind of knowledge about the UFO phenomena, yet bring it up to 2023, and there seems to be this ignorance once again that anybody has any kind of knowledge everyone just shrugs their shoulders and like yeah no you know we've uh, this is all news to us do you think that's just part of it that's part of that disinformation campaign never acknowledge that you know something we can go back into the early 1950s and even maybe a little earlier than that where we can see this disinformation campaign being created and there, there are moments where the Air Force, having inherited this from the Army Air Forces, did legitimate investigation 
and we can go. We can look at places where they just didn't care anymore, and the uh, investigations were haphazard and incomplete. We get to 1953 after the Washington National sightings and all the UFOs being seen over the country in 1952, July of 1952, where the Robertson panel meets. Robertson panel sponsored by the CIA. Members of the panel were mostly rabidly anti. UFO flying saucer. Ed Ruppelt, who was the chief of Project Blue Book at the time, I think he was interviewed for half a day. Heineck was kept out of uh, out of the uh, sessions mostly, that sort of thing. And then they concluded, well, there's really nothing to it. We need to start a campaign where teachers are won't allow students to do book reports on UFOs or have projects that deal with UFOs and get hold of Disney to create a campaign suggesting there's nothing to it get a couple of really uh, mysterious sightings that we've solved and make make a note of that to the public so they'll lose their interest in UFOs. We can go on and on, 1960, the late 1960s, the, the Condon Committee, the scientific investigation of UFOs at the University of Colorado. This is supposed to be the end all. They have access to everything, except they didn't. And um, we have the documentation now that shows that the conclusions were written before the investigation started. We have a letter from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Hitler, who was the Air Force, one of the Air Force liaison officers, saying, this is what we'd like you to find. The Air Force had done a good job on investigating UFOs. There was no national security implications and uh, nothing of a scientific value can be uh, uh, obtained by continued investigation, so you can stop. And lo and behold, 18 months later, that's exactly what the Condon Committee found. In fact, Condon was at a convention or a sp speaking in Corning, New York, to a group of engineers and scientists. And he said, well, right now, I'm inclined to say there's nothing to that, but I'm not supposed to learn that for another 18 months. Mm -hmm. So the fix was in there. And we have to we have to listen to the scientific community say, well, a scientific study was done and they found nothing. No, a scientific study wasn't done, but a, a propaganda campaign was started and it worked very well for a number of years. But we're now finding all kinds of things wrong with the, um, the Condon Committee report. My favorite explanation in the Condon Committee report was uh, they had studied a UFO sighting that took place in, over the Atlantic Ocean. There were pilots involved in it and all this. And they determined that this was a natural phenomenon so rare it had never been seen before or since. I'm thinking there's something of a scientific value that you might want to study if you've got this natural phenomenon. The other thing, there was a series of sightings around Belt, Montana, which is Maelstrom Air Force Base in 1968, I think it was. At the time, a whole flight of missiles had been shut down from an outside source. Allegedly, you couldn't do that. Nobody knew how to do that. If a flying saucer was involved and the science, flying saucer reports were there, if they had been able to shut down, disable this whole flight of missiles, that was a national security implication. And we know that one of the Condon Committee investigators who had a top secret clearance was uh, talking to the UFO officer at Maelstrom Air Force Base and brought up this shutdown of the missiles. And the officer said, you're not supposed to know about that and I can't talk about it, even though the guy had a top secret clearance. So we can see this whole history of that. And now it's repeated today. We're getting the same thing. What did Arrow find? Well, we can't find any evidence of anything suggesting that there was an off-world involvement here at all. We've looked at these cases and we haven't been able to, we haven't been able to uh, solve some of them, but we, if we had proper data, we could have. Uh, but there's nothing alien involved here. So we're getting the same thing. We're now in what I think is, is twining 2.0 or maybe 2.3, 3.0, giving us the same things that we'd gotten time and time for the, the last half century. You know, when you mentioned that about if we had more information, back in the days of Project Blue Book, we had two categories there. We had unknown and we had insufficient information, as you know. And of course, their excuse would be often with the unknowns. If we had more information to go on, we'd probably have an explanation. Well, then why would it be under unknowns? Wouldn't it be under insufficient information? That was always the confusion. Well, I think the, the insufficient data for a scientific analysis category was created so they didn't have to label it as unidentified. So they kept the number of unidentified cases low which is what they wanted. But the other problem is I did a random survey of going through the Project Blue Book files of 
the number of cases listed in insufficient data and learn that there's four to 5,000 of them that are labeled as insufficient data. And some of them truly ha are insufficient data. They didn't have um, the information they needed to do an investigation. Well, we have insufficient time to answer this question, but we'll be back with more. With Kevin, Gene, Tim, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> Whoa, Memorial Day! That means summer is here, and if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to buy Body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. Period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's nix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's knix.com. This is Jerome Clark, author of The UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast So Kevin Randall is going over the Project Blue Book cases, marked insufficient information, thousands of them, and let's go on with what you were finding. There was one case from late in Project Blue Book, I think it was 1968, uh, from Austin, Texas, and it was labeled insufficient data for a scientific analysis. Well, the guy was very interested in that, wanted to know why. He sent a long, nasty letter to the Air Force and said, you know, this lieutenant came out, we went over your form very, very carefully. We filled out all the information. We got it for you. Why is it insufficient data? And uh, eventually they, they labeled it as unidentified. I, I covered that in the book, uh, Project Blue Book, Exposed. I, I list that case because I found that fascinating. But sometimes, to be perfectly fair, there wasn't insufficient data, and you wonder why they didn't follow up on it. And I think part of it was, especially when they were in a time of great UFO activity, sightings and whatnot, the staff was always very small, and they just didn't have the manpower to complete the investigations. So th there was some of that. The case I mentioned earlier um, from March of 1952, uh, there are points in there where I couldn't believe they didn't ask follow-up questions. There was a, um, when the guy is describing the UFO, he talks about some kind of a bubble on the side of the craft with an aperture, a porthole-like opening in the craft and he said but the guy was too frightened to describe any faces or or something like that and i'm thinking well that implies that he saw some kind of a shape inside that porthole but there's this one line and they never followed up on that and they didn't get the date right they're all over the map on the dates and, you know, it, I mean, here I sit in 2024, in the last two days, I was able to straighten some of that out. If the file hadn't been so badly redacted, and, and, and to be fair, again, when they were collecting these stories, they would tell the witnesses, your names will not be released to the public. 
And especially in 1952, that was really a bad thing to happen because your friends and family and everybody would make fun of you for seeing a flying saucer. So I understand them redacting the names, uh, but they didn't do a very good job of it. So I was able to put the names back in. But there's a newspaper clipping and, and there's no sign of that in the file, but there was a newspaper report that would have straightened all this out. So a lot of the information that they gathered about from other witnesses. Well, they were outside on March 29th and they didn't hear anything and they didn't see anything. There's a, a bridge operator who was talking about being on duty from you know, 4 p.m. to midnight on March 29th and he is in the area and he should have been able to see something and he didn't. Well, that's great, but it would have been better if they'd asked about March 15th when this sighting actually occurred. So there's all those sorts of problems going on. Some of the cases we had one that Bob Cornett and I went through the files literally decades ago when they were first released to the public arena, I think in 1976. We found one which was a joint military civilian observation of the moon, which cracked us up, thinking that people couldn't identify the moon. And then I got involved in a case in, I think, Wisconsin, where actually that's exactly what happened. The guy couldn't identify the moon. And to be fair, again, uh, he'd gone outside and there was low hanging clouds and they were moving across the sky. So it gave a motion to this blob like object. The case was actually the moon. And I thought, oh, great, yeah, an observation of the moon. So you bring all of that stuff in to kind of get to where you need to go. I see that a lot, though. <laughs> I mean, these stupid explanations oh, it's the Venus, oh, it's the moon, oh, now it's drones. You know, drones. I could, I could see how people could be fooled by them, but you know, it, it it's like they just try to come up with the first thing that comes to their mind as an explanation, and most people are just going to go with it. Absolutely. Well, the the authorities know what's going on. They 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 they've concluded this is Venus. And I, I have to say that Venus is is does fool an awful lot of people because you. You see it all the time. I Not that long ago, um, watching the local news, uh, they announced, I think it was the other guy announced, uh, that bright light you see sort of hovering over the horizon, that is in fact Venus. But when Venus is very close and very bright, it gives off the impression of being much closer than it is, and it's, um, it does fool people. On the other side of that coin, um, there was a series of sightings in at White Sands Missile Range in November of 1957. MPs made the sighting, and the Air Force wrote off one of the sightings as Venus. And one of the one of the um, guards at, uh, MPs at White Sands who was involved in that said, "No, this the thing came down below the the horizon, the mountains in the background. It was a hundred yards away from us. It wasn't Venus." And yet people will see that and say, well, yeah, it was probably Venus. And we run into the same problem, with, again, going back to Roswell with this idiotic mogul explanation. I don't know how many times people have said, well, yeah, it was a top secret balloon project, and that's why they couldn't talk about it. Yeah, the purpose was top secret. The, what was going on in New Mexico was not top secret. It was just regular weather balloons and Raywin targets, and everybody could have identified them. I don't understand why people accept that explanation without much in the way of questioning where it came from. Well, there does seem to be a mindset, I think, that if there is an explanation, no matter how far-fetched it is, I think that most people are ready to accept that because it's it's not a it's not a bizarre explanation. You know, I mean, it's not, we don't know what it is. It's, you know, something weird flying around in the sky. I, I remember during the 1980s uh, East Coast UFO flap with the triangles, I guess a, a local newspaper had put out that all the UFO sightings were of an airplane that had, oh, advertising lights on it, advertising for a local chicken place. And all the newspapers published it. And I mean, there are still people today who say, oh, yeah, well, that's what it was. Turns out, though, that that aircraft had uh, 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 difficulties all during the time that uh, these sightings were taking place and was not airborne. Yet people still go to that as the explanation. Like I said, it's the same thing with the Roswell case. Um, they don't understand that flight, the flight was canceled. We have the documentation to prove it. And they say that, uh, well, they flew a um, service flight later on, and that's what it was. But the service flight would have been a cluster of balloons, and it never got off the White Sands missile range, test range. 
Charles Moore, who was the one of the engineers on the project, who said that they'd launched the balloons at three o'clock in the morning, uh, and yet according to the documentation, they'd canceled the flight at dawn. So how can you cancel a flight that you've already launched? Um, and the the um, explanation of it was uh, the balloons with Ray-1 radar targets, according to the documentation, there were no radar and radar targets being used on the first flights in New Mexico. So you've, you've eliminated everything and, and they still want to believe it was a balloon and that the rancher was too dumb to understand it was a balloon and the officers and enlisted men at Roswell were too dumb to identify the balloon when they see when they saw it. Um, so I, I, I know I, I get your frustration on that. I get people wanting to accept the uh, terrestrial explanation as opposed to the extraterrestrial explanation. But right now, there's no good explanation for what fell on the Brazil Ranch back in 1947. Everybody agrees something fell, but there is no good terrestrial explanation for it. So where do we go from there? I've got to, I've got to circle back around to, to Roswell again. I was waiting to ask this uh, uh, earlier. Was there anybody who came out uh, with a Roswell story that that you feel is legitimate before they were talking about this before the book came out. Yes, there there were a number of mentions of the Roswell case prior to that. Frank Edwards, in his book uh, Flying Saucer Serious Business, mm -hmm. I think it's chapter four, talks about picking up the pieces, and he talks about. He doesn't have any names except Roswell, Roswell, New Mexico, but he mentions them finding finding the debris and that sort of thing. And the Air Force came out with this explanation, held up a kite with a pie tin attached to it, which, of course, is not true. The wreckage was there in Rainey's office. But there's mention of the Roswell case prior to, to um, the Roswell incident. Lydia Schleppe was a teletype operator in one of the radio stations. I think she was in Albuquerque, and the guy in Albuquerque, owned the station there, and he owned the KGFL in Roswell, New Mexico. We'll have more with Kevin, Gene, Tim, you're in. The Paracast. Whoa, Memorial Day. That means summer is here, and if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I, and I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. Period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's nix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's knix.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, 
Here's Gene Steinberg. Let's go into that. Let me tell you briefly, I knew Frank Edwards slightly. Back in the mid-60s, Jim Mosley had me sit in the studio audience of an appearance by Edwards, and it was all arranged in advance, where I asked him a question. Then after the show, we started talking, and we communicated back and forth by mail, and then he died shortly thereafter. Not for anything that I did. Let's go on what you were telling us, Kevin. Well, we can get to Frank Edwards in another part of the story as well. While we were at break, I remembered it was Merle Tucker who owned the station in Albuquerque and owned the uh, one of the stations there in Roswell, or was a partner with them in Roswell. But Lydia Schleppi was a teletape operator. It was a guy named Johnny McBoyle was on the phone with her, and he'd been out to the ranch, and he'd seen the, seen everything and was describing what he had seen on the ranch and what the military was doing. And the transmission that she, she was putting on the teletype was interrupted and told her, do not transmit, uh, you know, stop this, stop putting out this story. This came out in a magazine article in 1976, which was, what, four years before the book came out and two years before Jesse Marcel made a splash with, with Stan Friedman and Lynn Stringfield. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, we, we've got that sort of information as well. But uh, I know her testimony was criticized by Carl Flock and somebody else who I will not name for any amount of money, who said, well, there was no way for that to be interrupted, the, the, her transmission to be interrupted. If you read her affidavit, as it appeared in uh, the Fund for UFO Research's investigation of Roswell and the documentation they put out, she mentioned in her affidavit that there was a bell that would alert her if there was something coming in, and she would switch from transmit to receive. So there was a mechanism for that to happen. But the real important point was she was talking about this two years before Jesse Marcel began to talk and four years before the book came out. Wilcox, Inez Wilcox, wrote a story called Four Years in the County Jail. Inez Wilcox was married to George Wilcox, who was the sheriff of Chavez County back in 1947 and was involved in this as well. When you got elected sheriff, almost always the, the wife ended up as sort of the matron, matron of the jail and that sort of thing. So she was involved in it as well. But she wrote an article about that. And in that article, she wrote about the story of the little men. So she mentioned it in the article. The only problem is she didn't date the darn thing. Um, so I don't really know if it came out after the publicity on the book or before, but but we do have that document as well. What I was going to say about Frank Edwards, I was looking for stories in the newspaper that predated Arnold that talked about flying saucers, discs, not flying saucers, but disc-shaped objects, saucer-shaped objects. And Edwards had talked about a case from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where an engineer had seen nine or ten disc-shaped objects on this, on the um, same afternoon, or maybe the day before, Arnold sighting appeared, and it was in the it was in the newspaper that afternoon before the Arnold story broke everywhere. And I thought this is exactly what I'm looking for, but I chased it down, and it was there was a story in the Gazette, Cedar Rapids Gazette about it, but it was published three days later, and the guy wasn't in Cedar Rapids; he was in Peoria, Illinois. And so it didn't fit the, the mold, but, but Edwards had apparently seen the story in the Cedar Rapids Gazette and was trying to write about it from memory and just got everything confused. So I was, I was kind of disappointed in that, but that was, that was my contact with Frank Edwards uh, indirectly. I always like Frank Edwards' book, but then again, being an Indiana boy, and, uh, of course, his center of operations was Indianapolis, Indiana. And, of course, he was uh, a popular broadcaster and uh, was taken off the air because, God, who was it? Was it? it was George Meany, when, uh, uh, who was his boss, was asked why Frank Edwards was taken off the air. And it, the reply was because he talked too much about flying saucers. Yeah, I'd heard that, too, as well. My good friend was um, Brad Steiger. It was a good Iowa boy. And I knew I knew when I started my, my writing, I knew the key to finding him. I knew he taught uh, at the college up there in um, the Cora, Iowa. But I knew that his phone number was listed as Eugene Olson, which was his birth name. He had his name legally changed to Brad Steiger later on. 
and uh, he became a good friend of mine. I'd called him one day. I was working on an article about strange disappearances, and he had one in one of his books. And I called him to ask it about it, ask about it, and we had a nice chat about that. And we became very good friends. I had him on my uh, podcast radio show a couple of times. I, I was able to talk to him just a couple of months before he passed away. I was kind of a great loss to the UFO field as well because he was a really good guy. His attitude was, and I always I always admired this, um, he was going to believe what anybody told him until he learned otherwise. In other words, he gave everybody the set, the, the um, benefit of the doubt. I always had to operate under the, uh, op, uh, the, 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 the idea that we need to vet everybody. You know, Don't believe anything they tell you until you can verify it from other sources. But, but I always thought his attitude was much better and, and he was really um, more interested in, in telling the stories. But he would, he would, he would, um, go, uh, he would learn the truth and then and and expose it. Um, Al Balick, I think, was the uh, Philadelphia exper- experiment guy. Yeah. Who yes. got a lot of publicity, and he and Brad Steiger were good friends. And I think Brad was very disappointed when he discovered that Balick wasn't telling the truth. I mean, that's what Brad told me that that he didn't. He just he. He invited him to his home, and they'd been friends. And he, he learned that the story just wasn't true, and he was very disappointed in that. But I I thought it was always, you know, it's hard to it's hard to explain um, the difference in our I guess our approach to the subject. He was he was a little bit more liberal in accepting the material. I was a little bit more conservative in accepting the material. And, and granted, I got fooled too by people that I thought were telling us the truth. And but I always kept lurking, looking for the things. It's kind of like the the cattle mutilations, which I now believe are probably all terrestrially explainable. But I revisit that periodically to see if there's new inf- information and new evidence that might suggest something else. And I think that's as as investigators and researchers and historians in the field, that's what we got to do because what we thought at one time may have been great, uh, but later information that we get access to gives us a different story. And and some of that is because in the other days, you had to go to the places, you had to go to the newspaper files, you had to talk to the people there where they were. In today's environment, you can sit in your home and you can get all that information without leaving leaving your home at virtually no cost. I mean, uh, call, trying to get witnesses and talk to them over the telephone, you don't get to see the body language. You can get hit, hints by the, the voice inflections and the way they're telling the story, but it's always better to be in the room with them to watch what they're doing. The best example I have of that is Sheridan Cavett. Now, he's a counterintelligence guy at Roswell, who says, nah, it was just weather balloon. He went out there with, with Marcel and Brazel. So no, it's just weather balloon. Don and I uh, saw him in uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, which is outside Fort Huachuca. And if you know about Fort Huachuca, that's where the Army trains their intelligence people and things like that. But he was there uh, in the winter of the winter back in the early 1990s. His regular home was in Washington State. And I was talking to him, and Don was engaging his wife in conversation so that I could focus on him. And we were purposely trying to separate them so we could uh, investigate the story separately, even though they're in the same room. And I asked him about the bodies and he got very upset. He leaned forward, he picked up a magazine, threw it down, leaned back and said, Bill Rickett tell you that? And I said, no, it was Edwin Easley, which was a lie, but I was trying to t- protect Bill Rickett. And he relaxed. I mean, of course, I immediately knew I'd blown the blown that part of the conversation. But the interesting thing was, had I not been in the room, I would not have seen his reaction to the question about the alien bodies and how upset he got at that time. So uh, we, we got to look at all of that sort of thing as we go through the invest investigations. So much you learn when you're there in person talking to somebody rather than communicating online somewhere or in the messenger app for facebook we've got kevin d randall gene steinberg tim swartz it means you're in the podcast
Whoa, Memorial Day? That means summer is here, and if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to Body. Body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. Period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's knix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's knix.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned in to the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? Just a quick word about the late Brad Steiger. He named this show. We were going to call it Paracast World. And he said, why don't you call it the Paracast? This is back in 2006. And he was on the first episode, along with Jim Mosley. They're on half one, half the other. And we've posted the original episode, or reposted, because it was always there, for listeners now who are just tuning in after all this time. So if you want to learn more about Brad Steiger, always enjoyed talking to him. He was quite he, a guy. He, he, was, he was a very good guy. He was very helpful to me. And we had a good friendship. And we always had, we had the big joke of who'd written the most UFO books. I thought it was him and he thought it was me. And uh, now I'm worried about Nick Redfern taking the title from one of us. But, I don't uh, know. Nick's been kind of out of it for a while. Well, he was writing an awful lot of books, but then again, so was I. So, uh, I, in, in fact, I just, a while ago, I published 1973, which is a book about the sightings in 1973 that focuses on the Pascagoula abduction, which if there's abductions, this is it. This is the one that you could believe. It's a very solid case, I think. And I was inspired to do that by Calvin Parker, who was one of the one of the abductees, he and uh, Charles Dixon, who I also spoke to. But uh, I thought that was, it, it's a very very interesting case. But uh, you know, Brad and I argued about that point. I think Brad ended up writing 180, 190 books, but there were ghosts and paranormal events and all kinds of things. He uh, invented the pen name Eric Norman, I think. He and a guy named Warren Smith were palling around doing UFO and Bigfoot and all that kind of thing, books in the 60s and 70s. And uh, I think uh, Warren Smith eventually absconded with the name Eric Norman, <laughs> which kind of annoyed annoyed Brad Steiger a little bit. But I guess that's really not important. <laughs> <laughs> I often Pardon wondered me? for a while if Warren Smith wasn't another pseudonym of Brad's. No, they worked together. And Warren Smith scared me to death one day. We were talking about writing this, this about this phenomenon, whether it's Bigfoot or ghosts or ESP or flying saucers or whatever. And Smith said to me, you ever make stuff up? <laughs> and I said, no. He said, yeah, well, I'm, you know, if I get kind of hung up on a story, I might throw in a case or two that uh, I've made up. And I'm thinking, oh, great, that's just wonderful. You've now just wiped out all of your uh, your work. 
But Warren Smith was somewhat of a con man. If there were two ways to do something, a, a nice legal way or a con, he'd go with a con every time. Mm. So he passed away a number of years ago. He lived in uh, Clinton, Iowa, for those of you keeping score at home. I never paid much attention to him after the early days. Well, he, he, was, he was kind of instrumental in the Ashland, Nebraska abduction back in, what, 67, 68, Herb Shermer. But the problem was, um, he said that uh, he had driven out. I mean, one of the photographs you see, I think, of, of Shermer in uniform, I think it's in, in Blum's book, was taken by Warren Smith. But he, um, he claimed at one point that he'd been out and he'd seen the um, burned area where the UFO had landed. And I knew that Smith always carried a camera with him to illustrate the stories. And I often wonder why he didn't take a picture of that. In other words, I don't believe, I, I think he just put, put himself into the story that way. He did, it was in Ashland, Nebraska. He did talk to Shermer, but he added that one detail to make it a little bit more authentic. So uh, you know, take that with a grain of salt, I suppose. That was always a classic case, uh, Shermer, that yes. I thought was legitimate. I think... Um, I think he's had the UFO sighting. I'm not sure about the abduction part of it. And I'd, I had tried to find some of the initial information prior to the hypnotic regressions that he underwent that, that finally uh, revealed the, the abduction part of it. I know that uh, working with Jim Harder, that um, we'd sit with the victim, the abductee, the experiencer, and he would... I think in his mind, he was trying to um, relieve their experience. I mean, he, he didn't want them to, to be upset by the hypnotic regressions. And he would feed them information. And one of the cases, and I actually talked about this in 1973, which is the book title, not the year. Um, we were in Utah investigating an abduction. And between the sessions... We had we were relaxing, trying to calm down the the experiencer, and he began to talk about the Barney and Hill, Betty Hill case, and talked about how Betty Hill thought she'd been examined and things like that. Well, in the very next uh, hypnotic regression session, the, our experiencer began to talk about having having been examined on board the UFO. Mm. It was somewhat similar to what uh, Harder had said to her prior to that session. And it wasn't until years later that as I was going over the transcripts, I began to see the places. Because I was there and, and knew what transpired between the sessions and things in the sessions, I could see where Harder was leading the witness in a specific direction. And Harder had said to me at one point, he just wanted to validate the Barney and Betty Hill case. And he thought this was a good way to do it, meaning... What he was doing with the woman in, in Utah thought this would help validate the case. I believe the case in Utah was a, an episode of sleep paralysis based on my investigation and, and how that went down. And again, that's all detailed in the book 1973. Uh, there's a long section about that with, with some of the uh, transcripts of the hypnotic regression sessions and things like that. But she had said that she thought there had been a prowler in the house and I went to the police station, and the reason I was able to get the date of the, the abduction, which I think was October 17th, 1973, um, because she had called the police. So there was that aspect of it. But I think it, was, I think it was an episode of sleep paralysis that precipitated the whole event. Yeah, there's just, uh, uh, I, I have a mistrust, and rightfully so, I think, of, of these hypnotic regression uh, uh, revelations. Uh, when they first were started, uh, after the, you know, Betty and Barney Hill case, it just, I don't know. I mean, uh, so many of these encounters had similarities, but like the Shermer case, you know, when it comes to the occupants, they're very one-off. You, you don't, you don't see a lot of repeats going on. Unless you see the, unless you watch the movie Mars Needs Women. <laughs> but that's a whole other argument. I think I think one of the problems, Carl Lorenzen said to me one time that 
they were getting the same kind of occupants and reports from all over the country, and the witnesses had no way of knowing one another. And I thought the connection is the researcher. They are all talking to one another. Mm -hmm. And and um, so they are, I think, unconsciously for the most part, leading the uh, witness in, into the arena they want to attend. Um, John Mack had said that he was surprised at the matching of the um, witness to the researcher, meaning that Bud Hopkins got the cold calculating um, scientific uh, aliens. Um, David Jacobs got the uh, ones creating hybrids. John Mack got the ones with a more Eastern philosophy. And he said, there's a strange matching. And he didn't understand that. And I'm thinking, good God, the answer is simple. Uh, but Hopkins leads his witnesses where he wants them to go. And if you read his transcripts, you can see the, the, the gentle nudging. And it, I'm sure it un, was unconscious on Bud's part, but you could see the nudging of the people in, in uh, directions. And you could see that in the other transcripts that we, we've gotten that uh, the person would say, well, I, I, I don't remember anything. And they'd say, well, it, you, you're, you're standing on an escalator. You can go deeper and deeper and deeper. Now what do you see? And they keep urging the person to come up with something that they eventually do. And I think that's one of the things they didn't understand about hypnosis. They think that there was a deeper level of hypnosis that they could access by um, the, the methodology they were using. And all they were doing was to suggesting to the uh, uh, experiencer that this is uh, where I want to go. And they pick up these cues and, and repeat them back. And you can see that in the transcripts, which is not to say more with Kevin Randall, Gene Steinberg, Tim Swartz. You're in the Pedicast. Save big on your Memorial Day barbecue, all in the Fries app. Get tender USDA choice bone and ribeye steaks for five seventy seven a pound with a digital coupon. Limit five. Then buy two get three free on twelve packs of delicious Coca Cola, Pepsi, Dr Pepper, or Seven Up, all with your card. Shop these deals at your local Fries, less than five miles away, or click the screen now to download the Fries app to save big today. Fries, fresh for everyone. Prices and product availability subject to change. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Whoa, Memorial Day. That means summer is here. And if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to Body body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Hey, this is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So here, of course, Kevin Randall probing the leading questions, looking at transcripts of hypnotic sessions with abductees, seeing that they're being taken. The point I need to make is it doesn't happen with every, every abductee, but you can see the enthusiasm of the researcher looking to, to corroborate specific information. And you have to be very careful in the questioning. I think the, the research on hypnosis now suggests I remember Harder telling me, well, you can't lie under hypnosis. Well, yeah, you can. Um, they say, well, you can't be made to do anything that would go against your moral, moral fiber. Well, yes, you can, depending on how it is presented to you in the hypnotic state. So you have to take a look at all of that thing, and you have to be very careful on the questioning. I did a book um, called Conversations with a woman who believed she had been abducted. 
And I didn't do the hypnotic regression. I had someone else do it, but I was sitting there with the sessions. And we were always very careful on asking the questions because we didn't want to suggest an answer in the question. And it eventually turned out was she wasn't abducted. She was having a past life experience. And, and that's kind of all laid out in this book, Conversations, which just hasn't done a whole lot on the uh, People just don't seem to want to read that book for some reason, but I thought it was kind of an interesting story. Her, her, her claim was that uh, she was talking about having been involved with Jack the Ripper in London, and there was some things that she knew that wasn't really common knowledge at the time, but now it is pretty much common knowledge. She ended up there, and once we moved it out of the arena of alien abduction, and we didn't move it on purpose, we did it accidentally by the guy saying, trying to get back a little bit earlier in her in her subconscious and she just went way back and came up with this story about Jack the Ripper and other serial killers and things like that but it was you know it's just one of those things you have to be very careful and I know he and I would pass notes uh, about how to phrase the questions because we didn't want to suggest anything and it was her suggestion that took us back into the past lives as opposed to somewhere else with the with the UFO. The, the only positive part of that was our research, she was having trouble sleeping and she was having, having a lot of um, anxiety and our research actually removed some of that anxiety from her. That was, that was kind of a good thing. You're talking here about a possible past life. Is it possible she once read a book on Jack the Ripper and other serial killers and was recalling that? Absolutely possible. Absolutely. But this was in the mid-90s, I believe. I have to look at my notes. In the, in the mid-90s. And she didn't seem to have an interest in that sort of thing. And when she would come up with some of the materials that she did, I would go to the, the library at the University of Iowa or wherever and attempt to validate the information. And I could find validation for some of it. So the information was out there. To, to be learned. And you wondered where a young housewife would have come up with that stuff because the information wasn't that pr prevalent. It's not like today where you can turn on the TV and there's 400 documentaries on Jack the Ripper or, or past live regressions or UFOs or Bigfoot or whatever. So you can get sucked into all of that stuff. This was pr just prior to the explosion of all of that sort of availability. And so that made it a little bit more legitimate in my mind. But it's always possible that she had picked up that information through osmosis. I guess the best example I can think of that is in a trivia contest, I was asked what uh, on, on the King of the Hill, what was the occupation of the guy? And I said he worked in propane. And I don't know why I knew that because I never watched the show, but somehow I picked up that on the commercials or something like that. You just kind of pick up these things and you make those associations in your mind that takes you in the right direction. It happens if you watch Jeopardy periodically, I'll have the same thing. Oh, the clue suggested this and I can get to the answer, even though I didn't know the answer originally, it kind of came through the osmosis of things I've seen and read in the past. I think we've all done something like that. You know, when you mention, of course, leading questions by abduction researchers that bring a certain result, we once had Dr. Jacobs on the Paracast. This is when Chris O'Brien was the co-host. And I asked him about leading questions, and he responded almost angrily, there are no leading questions. But that, of yeah. course, sums up what you were saying before, that he's well, getting I'm all this stuff about alien hybrids because he's taking them on that trip. Yeah, well, and, and, and the answer is, well, there are no leading questions. I think, well, why don't you sit in a court of law once in a while? Uh, or watch a TV story with a court, uh, courtroom drama on it. Yes, there are leading questions. And the, and, and the lead, lead can be very, very insignificant. It may be the expression used by the, the operator. It may be uh, the tone of his voice. He gets it somewhere. There was one case where the um, operator was trying to get information and the witness kept saying, I, I, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. And he finally shot at her. Well, then make it up. I'm thinking, what good is that going to do us? But uh, if, you look at, if you look at the books and read the transcripts that they put in the books, you can see some of the leading questions. And like I say, with Harder, the lead 
wasn't necessarily during the session, but came about before the session, talking about this sort of thing. And part of what he was attempting to do was make sure that the witness was calm and not anxious about what was coming up in the next session and that sort of thing. So he was feeding her information. Stan Friedman used to send packets of information to witnesses before he interviewed them. And I thought, why would you do that? Um, Edwin Easley, who was a provost marshal in Roswell in 1947, actually sent me a, um, a Xerox of the envelope that Stan Friedman had sent him. And he, he wrote on it that he hadn't um, opened it. He didn't want to see any of that information to contaminate it. But he, I thought, well, here's Friedman sending a bunch of papers about Roswell to the provost marshal before he even interviewed the guy. But Stan never interviewed the guy, by the way. Um, and I think I'm the only one who ever did. But the point simply is, you have to be careful with that sort of thing. I can understand the rationale behind it, but it does kind of destroy the scientific value of what you're gathering there because you can say, well, that person was contaminated, contaminated, contaminated by the questioning or material that was presented prior to uh, the investigations. Now, with Stanton Friedman, he was someone I knew moderately well over the years. And it came to a point in his latter years where he was just basically repeating slogans. Like a politician repeats his talking points, Stan had his talking points. Not that I think he was a bad person or anything like that, but I wonder from time to time what value he brought to the field because of that. He was a good salesman, though. Well, and he did some good research as well. We have to acknowledge that. But he did become, become uh, like you said, a propagandist for alien visitation, um, and he would often say absence of evidence doesn't mean um, evidence, ev ev absence of evidence is mean evidence of something, I forget the clue now. Evidence, God's, absence of evidence of doesn't evidence, mean yes, evidence of absence. Evidence, evidence yes, and yeah. I said to him, but it is when due diligence has been performed. I, I had read a book called The um, Dinosaur uh, Heresies, and they were talking about how they were finding fossils in this lake, but there weren't fossils of this specific turtle they thought should be there. And they determined that the the turtles were never in that lake. So absence of evidence became evidence of absence. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a great thing, but if you've got somebody who knows what the response is, then it kind of loses its cachet um, when you're discussing these things. But, but you know, uh, you, you've got to take a look at the whole picture, everything that's going on, and seeing if it does it fit into the mold we're developing of off-world visitation, or does it um, uh, suggest something else? You know, if you see a streak of light in the sky, uh, is that an alien spacecraft, or is that some private pilot with his landing light on? And the best example I have of that was a picture taken in Amana, Iowa, 1975. And we were trying to plot, with, with foreground detail, it was just a streak of light. And we were trying to plot the length of the flight path in the picture to see what speed it was going based on the ground references. We've got answers with Kevin, Gene, Tim, you're in. The Paracast. Whoa, Memorial Day. Well, that means summer is here. And if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to Body body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Have you made the switch to NYX? Millions of women have made the switch to the revolutionary period underwear from NYX. That's K-N-I-X. 
period panties from NYX are like no other, making them the number one leak-proof underwear brand in North America. They're comfy, stylish, and absorbent, perfect for period protection from your lightest to your heaviest days. They look, feel, and machine wash just like regular underwear, but feature incognito protection that has you covered. You can shop sizes from extra small to 4XL. Choose from all kinds of colors, prints, and different styles, from bikinis to boy shorts, thongs to high-rise. You've got to try NYX. See why millions are ditching disposable, wasteful period products and have switched to NYX. Go to knix.com and get 15% off with promo code TRY15. That's nix.com promo code TRY15 for 15% off life-changing period underwear. That's knix.com. Hi, this is James Fox, director of The Phenomenon and Moment of Contact. You're listening to The Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Kevin, that case you started in our previous segment, you want to pick up on it? What we were doing was trying to triangulate uh, using the landmark to see if we could pick up the speed of the object that thought it was was flying too slow to be a uh, private plane. Later on, Russ Estes, we had the good good solid photographs of those, and he was able to break blow them up on his computers, and we could actually see the aircraft at the front of the streak of light. So it was clearly an aircraft with a landing light on, but. Um, the witness said that he hadn't heard any sound, which is distinctly possible. And um, when I began looking at the map, I thought, well, if the airplane was flying at an angle, that would have lengthened the the time uh, it was in the exposure, and it would have le- got the speed up to where it should have been. So, you know, we had to look at all those sorts of things. Um, but but uh, I, you know, that's that's sort of the point. You have to look at all of that. And if you've got an airplane or a meteor that you just catch a glimpse of, it can fool you. I don't know how many times there has been a um, picture of a meteor or a meteor fall where people think it's a cigar-shaped craft with square windows on it. And we go back to 1968 with the uh, re-entry of the Zon 4 spacecraft as it broke apart. Most people saw it for what it was, but there were a number of people said they'd seen a cigar-shaped craft with square windows on it. You get just a glimpse of it, and you get that impression, and your mind fills in the details. So you have to be very careful with that kind of thing. You know, talking about the hypnotic regression and, and leading the witness, it reminds me a lot of the whole satanic scare of the 1980s, where you had supposedly all these cases of children coming forward, talking about how daycares, neighbors, even entire towns were involved in just all kinds of, of, you know, horrific, evil sexual activities. And I've seen a number of films that were taken of, say, like social workers, uh, uh, even, you know, like court officials interviewing these children. And there's no hypnosis involved, but the questions are so leading you know it's like right off the bat they're like tell us about the secret tunnels underneath the daycare centers things like that and then it just goes on from there and the the results were innocent people being arrested and sentenced to very long prison sentences and it wasn't until like very recently that officials have gone back and started releasing these people, not really confirming that they were wrong, but they know that they were. One of the things that we learned, and I say we, uh, Russ Estes, Bill Cohn, and I learned as we were putting together a book about alien abductions, was that the um, we looked at the satanic panic where, where this went on, and we're surprised uh, about these sorts of things. One of the cases that surprised me, because you can, you can see where you're in a police interrogation, and the methodology they use to lead you to, to confess to things you didn't do, which we, we find quite a bit, you know, helps in, in your conviction. But there was a sheriff's deputy who was involved in this, and his daughters accused him of all kinds of horrendous things. 
Uh, and during the interrogation, they, his friends, his friends would say, well, why don't you go back to your cell and think about this for a while and see, see how this could have happened. Hmm. And came up with the idea was oppressed. But then as they looked, and he went to jail, but they talked about pictures, but they could never find the pictures. The girls talked about horrendous things that had been done to them. They could find no evidence of, of that, you know, the, no, the scarring that they supposedly had. One girl said that her father got her pregnant. They took, they took her in to have an abortion, and there was no evidence of her ever having been pregnant. All kinds of things like that. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you can convince an awful lot of people. And if you've got a kid for crying out loud... And, 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 and you see that kind of thing. Well, Tommy said it happened. Uh, is Tommy a liar? Or are you, do you just have a bad memory? And, and the kid wants to conform. So they go on. There's a wonderful movie on HBO called the, about the McMartin case, which was the California case that was spread over years, literally. And the one guy was in jail because they couldn't get bail on him because of the horrific stories being told about him. And it turned out that uh, it was completely false. So, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. You just wonder here how many people might be in prison, how many people might be sentenced to life or have their lives taken from them who confessed under circumstances to things they hadn't really done. We, we see an awful lot of that with the Innocence Projects going out and, and attempting to find people who are uh, imprisoned improperly and the tactics used by the police to get the confessions and things like that. I've always said uh, the only words I'd ever say to the police if I was arrested was I want a lawyer and not engage in any kind of conversation with them. When I was, um, we took a number of classes in the military that talked about uh, if you become a POW, what to do. And one of the things that was we were browbeat was never tell them anything. Don't engage in conversations with them because a conversation leads somewhere and you just don't want to do that. And I think that's, you know, the, the proper advice if you've been a, accused of a crime, falsely accused of a crime, don't talk to the police. Get yourself an attorney because there is an awful lot of pressure that can be brought to bear on you and it doesn't take that long to... Um, begin to question your own memories and your own involvement in some of these things. Well, you see a lot of that play out on those Law & Order TV shows, the Chicago TV shows, and of course, the FBI show, where somebody might be led into doing something, but usually it's done in the past tense. As somebody confessed to the crime, they're going to be executed two days from now, and two seconds before they're executed, they find the real killer. Well, yeah, but that's that's not going to happen in real life because mm. they, they find the real killer and then they got to go through the trial, but the other guy's already dead. You know, they, they're not going to stop the execution just because, well, we think we found the real killer type thing, but it's a nice, nice way to have a TV show, I suppose. Well, you have to resolve it in 43 minutes plus commercials. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure we get 43 minutes of uh, programming anymore. <laughs> no, it's about 42 minutes and some odd seconds. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just absolutely ridiculous, the, um, the timing of these things. Well, we had almost the same thing with the Paracast when we were on the GCN network. But with the failure of that network, they closed it. We went back to the original strictly podcast version of the show, although we are heard on some online networks. What happens, though, is we now have about 35 or 40 percent as many commercials. So it's kind of like Amazon now. On Amazon Prime, they've added ads, so it's like a minute or a minute and a half. So you can take a deep breath and get back to the show. And that's what we do now. Well, the, the, the thing I've done is uh, watching on commercial television... I, I, I once timed the programming. With, I mean, we've got to, everybody's got to stop watching their phone. And I got uh, one, one program, I got five and a half minutes of commercials and then five minutes of program, and they were back into commercial. So I try not to watch uh, commercial television anymore. It's too commercial. Well, there are a couple of things you can do there. You can get a low-cost subscription. It's one of the services like for NBC, it's Peacock. For CBS, it's Paramount Plus. And if you get like the basic limited ads version, 
So you will have a couple of ads, but it's be something that lasts about a minute or 90 seconds. So it's not quite so bad, not quite so much interrupting. Or you learn to use the fast forward control, which is the I way am. I do it. I am very flexible with fast forward. The service we have, Cox, they also have a remote control that lets you go back about 10 seconds. So if you overshoot the mark, you can do that. But I agree with you there. Some commercial breaks are quick. Others just go on and on. And you see the timer in the timeline. And they just go on forever. And you wonder, who is paying for this ad knowing that nobody's going to sit there long enough to actually watch this stuff? Tim Swartz, Gene well, Steinberg, Kevin, D. Randall. That means you're in. The Paracast. <laughs> At LASIK Plus, we know LASIK is a big decision, and every one of our patients is unique. That's why we customize your LASIK journey to you. I'm so busy right now. We offer a mix of convenient days and times, including 30-minute virtual appointments to fit your schedule. I would love it, but I have astigmatism. We treat thousands of patients with astigmatism every month with great outcomes. LASIK Plus is making your journey towards 2020 vision all about you. So visit MyLASIKOffer.com today to start your LASIK journey. Whoa, Memorial Day. That means summer is here. And if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to Body body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com. Hi, this is Bryce Abel. I'm the producer of Dark Skies, the co-author of AD After Disclosure, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So here's where we stand with the show. It's going to end in this segment with a thousand things that we want to talk to Kevin about. But he will be back for the After the Paracast podcast for Paracast Plus subscribers. So we'll go there. I want to ask him also about the current Pentagon stuff and where that's leading or not leading about Condon 2.0. But right now, let's get to some answers here. I want answers. I want the truth. Can we handle the truth? Kevin Randall. It's centuries, it seems, since the Roswell case first came upon us. Is this something that can never be solved? First of all, how do you keep it a secret generation after generation? Because government bureaucrats just come and go. How have we kept it a secret? We're talking about it. The information is out there. It's just which side do you want to come down on? Does the government deny it? Yes. Does that make it right? No. We're still talking about it. We have information. We have a great deal of information about the Roswell case. It has leaked out. I think what you're looking for is a government official or somebody to say, yes, it really happened or present some of the evidence. I mean, I talked to a great number of the uh, men assigned to the Roswell Army Airfield in 1947, and every member of Colonel Blanchard's staff that we were able to interview said that it was some kind of an extraterrestrial craft with the exception of a guy named Barrowclaw, who was either the deputy commander or the executive officer. And his attitude was, it never happened, and now maybe these people will leave me alone. We haven't kept the secret. What we haven't got is the proof positive for some people. I have pointed out, you know, the there is no terrestrial explanation at this point. Everybody agrees something fell. There's no question about that. But what was it? Was it some kind of an experimental craft from the U.S. government? Well, why... Would they be keeping it secret today because anything they were experimenting with 75 years ago is badly out of date, wouldn't uh, compromise national security in any way. And if they had something like that, they would have trotted it out 
rather than this cockamamie project mogul explanation. So we have talked about it. We have people up and down the chain of command and uh, politicians who were involved in some aspect of this telling us how they were involved and what they saw and what they did. What we do not have is an official government statement uh, which says, yes, we picked up an alien spacecraft. So, you know, it's kind of a kind of a moot point now because of our discussions. Right. But we may assume something real happened, but whatever they have, the bodies, if there are bodies, the craft, that's still being kept somewhere. Or maybe it's stuck yes, away I in Area 13 or something, in Warehouse 13, where they gave up years ago on trying to figure it out, and they'd rather not think about things they can't understand. But as I say, I think, uh, you know, but, the, but the question really is, you know, how have they kept it secret? And the answer is they haven't. We know about it. It's just, what do you need in the way of evidence to persuade you that it was something alien? And for some people, the bar is very high. And for some people, it's not quite that high. I kind of come down leaning on the fence toward the alien explanation because I know of no terrestrial explanation. And my point simply is, if there was a terrestrial explanation in the mid-90s when the Air Force reinvestigated the Roswell case, if they had a legitimate answer, they'd have come out with it. The best they could do was Project Mogul. And the flight that they claim was responsible for the debris is documented to have not been launched. So they're without an explanation. That's where we are on Roswell. Now, is the information that we have sufficient to convince you or the listeners or somebody else that it was an alien spacecraft? That's you know a personal call. Where do you want to come down on the spectrum of Roswell being alien? You know, if if you're a, a true hardened skeptic, you want to see something a much, much more positive than an elimination of all the other terrestrial explanations. And if you're if you're kind of a believer, you might accept the idea more easily based on the evidence that we do have. But we still have this craft somewhere. Someone has this craft, some agency, someone in private industry. Someone has the wreckage of a craft from another planet. But what have we learned about it? How can you go from generation to generation with all this information and maybe get some vague whistleblowing but nothing solid? I think the problem is that we haven't figured it out yet. Now, if, we, if we've got an alien spacecraft, clearly the technology is going to be far superior to anything else on Earth. We don't want our competitors in the world to know about it. We want to be able to decode it and build the craft from it so that we take a leap forward. But the problem is, I think the technology may be so superior, we haven't figured it out yet. And I always use the example, which is now out of date, by the way, of a VCR video cassette recorder a videotape, a power pack, and a, and a television set and take it back to Merlin the Magician and say, okay, duplicate that. Well, to duplicate it, he's got a black ribbon there, but he has to know two things that are invisible to decode it. He's got to know about magnetism and electricity. And that doesn't get him to being able to uh, recreate something that's going to be able to read that thing without additional information. You know, he's got to invent television and the VCR, for example, to, to get it all done. And he just doesn't have the technological components in the culture to do that. And I think that where we are, if there was an alien spacecraft picked up in Roswell in 1947, that the technology is something that we simply do not understand. Bill Brazel talked about this wire that you could shine a light in one end and then come out the other. He was struggling with the word to tell us about fiber optics. We now have that. We understand that. But we, we don't have the sample of the material because Bill Brazel had to surrender to the military, according to what he told us several times. But the point simply is, I think the technology is of sufficient advancement that we do not understand it yet. We have not been able to figure it out. Well, if we send to Brazel the iPhone, that would still be something. Maybe you could get it to work until the battery wore out but still would be something way beyond what you can imagine. Billions of transistors in this tiny little thing that you need a, a special microscope to be able to discern. Are we ever, ever going to have a final answer to all this? Oh, eventually we will. I mean, we're out there looking, and I think that 
at any point, if we have our off-world visitors, at any point they can decide to end the conversation, just show up. I know in intelligence work, if the bad guys have learned something they shouldn't have learned and they're spreading the information around, there's no sense in you keeping it secret. Uh, they've, they've got it, they can reveal it. We might know it might be something important to us and we don't want it known. And so we keep it secret until they reveal it or it becomes a point where we no longer it's no longer that important for us to keep it a secret. The point being the visitation may reach a point where they, they're going to land at the river entrance to the Pentagon and say, here we are. That's across the river from where um, Klaatu was, by the way. Hey, Kevin Randall, for those who want to know more about the stuff you do, where can they check you out? They can go to Amazon and look up my books as Kevin Randall, or if they're in action adventure or science fiction mode, look up the books by Eric Helm, because I'm Eric Helm as well. My blog is kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Uh, the latest book is 1973, which deals with the whole sighting wave in 1973, uh, featuring the Kelvin Parker, Charles Hickson adventure. I've done Understanding Roswell, things like that at Amazon. Okay. You can find us on X, Threads, Facebook as The Paracast. Go to theparacast.shop to buy branded merchandise with four logos to choose from. To get this show without the network ads and their ultra special bonus after The Paracast podcast, go to theparacast.plus, theparacast.plus. Quick sign up, lowest rates ever. Kevin will be back on After the Powercast, by the way. But for now, Kevin Randall, thank you for joining us on the Powercast. Well, it's been fun so far. The Powercast. Featuring Gene Steinberg is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast. At LASIK Plus, we know LASIK is a big decision, and every one of our patients is unique. That's why we customize your LASIK journey to you. I'm so busy right now. We offer a mix of convenient days and times, including 30-minute virtual appointments to fit your schedule. I would love it, but I have astigmatism. We treat thousands of patients with astigmatism every month with great outcomes. LASIK Plus is making your journey towards 2020 vision all about you. So visit MyLASIKOffer.com today to start your LASIK journey. Whoa, Memorial Day! That means summer is here, and if you're struggling to get in shape and lose weight, I'm about to change your life. I'm Carl, the CEO of Body. That's B-O-D-I. And I don't like working out and eating healthy either. So here's how I get myself to do it. I make myself own the morning. And by the morning, I mean the first hour or so of every day, dedicated to my results and my health. And man, does it work. Every day, I get out of bed, drink a health shake, and then I go crush a workout from one of the 120 programs on the Body app and just follow along day by day. So here's my special offer to you. Because it's Memorial Day and I want you to get started now, the next 5,000 new subscribers who sign up for six months get the next six months free. That's full access to over 120 programs. So don't wait. See how fast the pounds can really come off. And if they don't, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Just go to body.com to buy six months and get the next six free. That's B-O-D-I dot com.